Good afternoon and welcome to the Latinos in the Essential Workforce session. My name is Janet Arias Martinez and I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives for CHCI, where I've served since 2013. I'm also a proud alum of our Congressional Internship Program. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Bank of America, Lyft, National Education Association, Service Employees International Union, and United Food and Commercial Workers Union for the generous support of this session. Before we begin our panel, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our panel host, Congressman Juy Garcia, and our panel moderator, Juan D. Gonzalez. Congressman Garcia represents the 4th Congressional District of Illinois and has been a progressive voice fighting to improve the lives of his working class neighbors, many of whom are immigrants like him. He's a coalition builder committed to empowering youth and expanding access to quality education, affordable housing, and economic opportunity. In March, Congressman Garcia co-sponsored the COVID-19 Healthcare Worker Protection Act of 2020, which directs the Department of Labor to promote additional protections for healthcare sector workers and other employees identified as having an elevated risk for exposure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This session will discuss the essential workforce, the Latino contribution to the nation's economy during times of crisis, and how we can ensure that workers who make our lives possible receive fair pay and are kept safe in the workplace. To help us moderate this important and timely discussion, we're delighted to have one of the nation's best known Latino journalists and activists for more than 40 years, Juan D. Gonzalez, co-host of the radio and television news show, Democracy Now! Juan is also the Richard D. Hefner Professor of Communications and Public Policy at Rutgers University. Again, welcome. I hope you enjoyed this session and don't forget to continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag CHCIHHM20. Good afternoon. Thank you, CHCI, for organizing this timely panel discussion. I'm Congressman Chuy Garcia, and I represent Illinois' 4th District. Today, we're connecting on a topic that is a central piece to the COVID pandemic, Latinos and the essential workforce. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Latinos have been on the front lines ensuring we can continue accessing the services our communities need in hospitals, warehouses, farms, grocery stores, and meat processing facilities, Latinos represent a significant portion of the essential workforce. My district in Chicago has a long history of labor and immigrant activism. Key moments in the American labor movement, such as the Pullman strike and the Haymarket massacre, took place in Chicago and ultimately achieved important victories, including the eight our workday and safety protections, as well as ending child labor. These decisive moments were shaped by immigrant workers from Mexico, Poland, Ireland, and many more. Despite facing incredible obstacles, workers knew the value of their labor and put their lives on the line to achieve justice. Workers today are no different. Many people in my district had no choice but to continue going to work as the virus spread. Despite their essential role, many of them were treated as expendable by employers and denied basic protections like masks, social distancing measures, and clear communication from management about positive cases in the workplace. As millions of workers across the country lost their jobs due to the virus and our unemployment claims reached historical records all over the U.S., workers were faced with the stark reality. In order to put food on the table, they endured unsafe work conditions. In the face of incredible hardship, frontline workers are not only maintaining our essential industries at great personal risk, they're also continuing the fight for justice, equality, and the dignity in the workplace. As a significant percentage of the essential workforce, Latinos led this effort. Unfortunately, they have not had an ally in the Trump administration. While workers have increasingly and too often fatally contracted the virus, Trump has chosen to protect employers and prevent OSHA from doing its job. It's taken a global pandemic to make people see the inherent connection between public health and workplace rights. My colleagues and I in the Hispanic Caucus have worked tirelessly to pass one of the most expansive labor rights packages we've seen in generations. 
and we're only getting started. It fills me with great hope to watch workers across the country mobilize to protect their rights and win policies so we that we desperately need. Farm workers, healthcare frontliners, and essential workers, regardless of citizenship, deserve to be treated with dignity. I'm so glad you are able to join CHCI today. I encourage you to elevate the stories of Latino frontliners and look forward to fighting for workers' rights with you. Si se puede. Well, welcome to all of you who are joining us here. Um, I'm Juan Gonzalez. Uh, so how can we ensure that the millions of Latino workers who form such a large share of our nation's essential workforce are kept safe during this pandemic while they receive, as, as Achua has mentioned, fair pay for, and to care for their families? And what does this unprecedented upheaval mean for the future of work? We've got a terrific panel here, a very short amount of time. So I'm going to get right to it. Uh, for those of you joining us, the conference hashtag is CHCIHHM20. That's CHCIHHM20. You're welcome to submit questions for our panel uh, after our round of questions, my round of questioning in the Q&A platform, Slido. Be sure to choose the drop down A portion on that menu and any comments, uh, submit them in chat. Uh, so I'm going to begin first by quickly introducing our panelists and then asking them to identify themselves, and then I'll start the round of questions. Starting with Ana Gonzalez Barrera. Hi, this is Ana Gonzalez Barrera. I'm a senior researcher at Pew Research Center, where I focus on the analysis of the Hispanic community, and I've been working there for about 10 years. Uh, now I would like to introduce Rocio Sainz, who is the executive vice president at SEIU. Hi, Rocio Sainz, Executive Vice President of SEIU. Hello, everybody. And Francisco? Uh, we're not hearing Francisco. Uh, let's move to Alberto Garofalo. Juan, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alberto Garofalo. I'm the Chief Community Reinvestment Act Officer for Bank of America. Uh, I also uh, lead community banking, uh, essentially focused on driving economic mobility across our low to moderate income uh, areas across the country. And I also help lead the Hispanic strategy for all of uh, consumer and small business for Bank of America and honored and delighted to be here with you today. And uh, Noel Candelaria, are you here? Gracias, Juan. Buenas tardes. Um, thank you, CHI, for the opportunity to be here for your annual conference. Uh, I am Noel Candelaria. I'm a high school special education teacher, just started uh, my term as a newly elected uh, secretary treasurer of the largest labor union in this country, the National Education Association. Um, I'm glad to be here and uh, looking forward to this conversation. And finally, Francisco Avalos. Yeah, uh, buenas tardes a todos. It's such a privilege uh, to be here with you today. And thank you uh, as well to CHCI uh, for continuing to build power for the Latino community uh, across the country and for the in invitation to participate uh, in this important discussion. So my name is Francisco and I get to oversee Lyft's community affairs for the West Coast, which includes uh, working with and advocating for drivers in addition to collaborating with uh, many uh, community organizations. So of course, our mission at Lyft is, is to improve uh, people's lives with the best world's best transportation and really excited to, to have that conversation and, and talk a little bit about that and, and these new COVID realities with the group today. Okay, so I'd like to begin with uh, Ana Gonzalez. Can you set the stage for us? What has Pew's research found out about the Latinx community, how it's faring with the pandemic and with this historic move to telework? And, and what particular obstacles does the community face? Definitely. Um, so the Hispanic community makes up 18% of the population, also 18% of the workforce in the U.S. Uh, only 26% of workers, of Hispanic workers, are able to telework. Uh, this compares with 40% of all workers. So. It's a much lower share, and they're also the group, the ethnic or racial group, that are the least likely to be able to telework. Um, and this is more pronounced, even more pronounced among immigrants, Hispanic immigrants. Only 18% of them have been able to telework, and one third of those who are born in the U.S. 
So this, of course, has had some impacts on them, among them uh, a higher rate of unemployment. They do have the highest rate of unemployment of all groups in the U.S. currently. And uh, what sectors of, among the Latino community, in the Latino community, Anna, have been most affected by the pandemic? I think some of your research has shown that uh, the unemployment is higher among women than, than among men during this last several months. And, uh, and that uh, six in 10 households uh, say they've experienced job losses or pay cuts. Can you break up that sector, the impact of the pandemic? Sure, definitely. So the workers who are less likely to be able to telework are also the ones that are more likely to uh, experience job losses. As you mentioned, women have been hit harder and also young people, also those without a bachelor's degree. Uh, among some of the sectors that we have identified as being at higher risk of job losses are those who are in food services and drinking places, accommodation, arts and entertainment and recreation, uh, childcare services, personal and laundry services, retail trade, and some transportation industries, uh, including um, flying and uh, other types of tra transportation. Uh, I'd like to now go to the other members of the group to talk about specific por uh, parts of the Latino economy and population that you are most familiar with, beginning with Noel Candelaria. Schools have been much in the news of late. How is the education sector faring, especially with so many different policy approaches at the local level? I mean, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges uh, that we've seen in, in our nation's public schools is, I mean, we, we know firsthand, uh, the, now we, we see firsthand the interconnectedness between um, our economy, um, our parents, especially in the Latino community, um, and our nation's public schools. Uh, what we are seeing right now is really heartbreaking, uh, you know, as, as schools um, are coming back into session and we're seeing, you know, local policies that are forcing, um, you know, children and educators back, um, you know, into situations that are currently not safe. Um, you know, we've already seen that Latinos are 25 percent of, of the children in our country, but currently account for 40 percent of the COVID-19 deaths among children ages 5 to 17. Um, you know, so when we're when we're looking at this data, um, it's alarming. As the as the former state president of the Texas State Teachers Association, uh, just a number that just came out yesterday, where we've already seen 434 students that are that are confirmed, um, you know, with positive and 716 staff. Um, we're seeing the direct impact on our students and educators and communities of color. Um, and that, that reality is really hard to grasp. This is why, um, you know, we've really been pushing for our all hands on deck uh, and bringing in the community, bringing in uh, the parents, the educators, of um, all the stakeholders, the, the small business owners to really talk about what it is that we need to safely reopen our schools. But we are seeing the challenges that our school districts um, have been facing as well with, within their budgets of not having uh, the resources that they need to, to safely uh, bring in all of our educators. And we're already starting to see the loss of, of jobs, especially amongst our education support professionals or you know, some of our critical um, you know, employees or our bus drivers, our food, handler, uh, food service providers, um, you know, our, our bus drivers um, who are critical during this space. And a lot, most often, um, you know, and, and especially in our communities of color, uh, they are the ones that live in the community that are not only being directly impacted, um, you know, with, with the impact on their children, but also the impacts, um, you know, around their around their job, which is, you know, why we're, we're calling on Congress, um, you know, to um, especially the Senate to pass the HEROES Act to provide the much needed resources um, that our communities need at the local level, um, you know, to safely reopen our schools. What does that mean to be able to connect all of our students uh, so that, you know, our, our communities can can, can get back to some sense of normalcy, but it has to be done safely. Um, and right now our, our districts uh, don't have the resources to truly op reopen uh, safely and bring people back into that, that closed space where it's safe. And Noel, speaking about this whole issue of uh, the schools uh, reopening with the proper resources, if the students continue to stay home with remote learning, I think some of the Pew research has shown 46% of Hispanics, according to Pew's research, don't have broadband at home. That figure has not increased since 2010. In over 10 years, it hasn't increased. How will children in those households fare if remote learning goes for an entire school year? 
Well, and, and that that's precisely why we've been, we've been pushing for the Heroes Act to provide you know funding to our districts, um, you know, to be able to 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 provide the resources and get them the resources at the end. We've seen uh, you know a lot of our districts, especially here in Texas and across the, the country, you know, they become innovative and you know they they you know brought hotspots out using utilizing school buses, uh, you know, to be able to connect other students. But the reality is that too many of our students still don't have. Uh, you know the what they need to be able to 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 adequately connect, um, and so as as we're looking at what all the needs are, we have to do a true a real assessment of of what the needs are in all of our communities, especially our communities of color, uh, to be able to connect our students. We know that uh, the best way to reach a student is is face to face, but not until it's safe. Um, and so, I mean, I, I mean, I know that not just as an educator, but as a father, you know, that nothing can replace the magic of a student's curiosity when they're able to learn alongside their peers, you know, from a teacher who's dedicated their lives to the success of their, of their students. So, you know, no one wants to welcome back students more th th than our educators across the country, but we have to have the resources and we need to have a real conversation across this country about reinvesting vigorously in our nation's public schools and in the infrastructure that is going to help connect all of our students um, because what what this what COVID nineteen has really unmasked is the inequities um, that that we know have been there all along, but have been masked by by our, our, our brick and mortar buildings that can provide you know a lot of these resources for our, resources for our students um, who don't have them. Um, which is why we've really been pushing to pass the Heroes Act, which would provide one hundred and seventy five billion dollars to our nation's public schools um, to to get them connected as as quickly as possible and get them of uh, what they need and, and partner you know locally uh, to be able to connect our students um, you know as quickly as possible. Uh, I'd like to bring Francisco into the conversation. Could you tell us talk to us about the trend how the transportation sector has been affected by COVID and uh, how it's uh, necessitated shifts in the business practices, not only for for public transportation agencies, but for the private sector as well, for the sharing economy in general. Uh, and what Lyft has uh, been doing as a company in particular to address these issues. Yeah, so as you can imagine, we lead with safety. And so our foremost responsibility is making sure that drivers are protected and passengers are protected out on the road, especially with increased limitations on how folks uh, move around cities, whether with bus restrictions and otherwise. And so we take this extremely serious and safety is fundamental to live. So we've, of course, established new health and safety standards for ride share. Uh, with the launch of like Lyft's health safety programs, which of course is based on CDC guidelines. And so this, this includes personal health certifications uh, that requires all riders and drivers uh, to self-certify that they're symptom free. So that means when they're getting into the vehicle, whether they're a driver that's about to start or whether it's an individual who's held a ride, um, now they have to certify that they aren't showing any symptoms. They have to commit to wear a mask throughout the ride. And of course, that they'll follow local CDC, uh, CDC guidelines and local health uh, official guidelines in order to participate in the ride share uh, economy um, and community as uh, at large. And so, of course, we've also began rolling out vehicle partitions to drivers over the course of the last couple of months and coming months. And so, uh, of course, it's just worth noting that we were the first rideshare company to implement these products and these policies. In addition to getting um, over 150,000 products uh, that we've distributed to date, uh, in, that includes um, sanitation wipes, reusable face coverings, sanitizers, disinfectants, and, and for some of our most active drivers, we've actually shipped uh, free safety kits for them as well. And so the priority is making sure that the community as a whole is protected, um, particularly from a health standard when they're getting in the vehicle. And as I mentioned, with, with buses and, and limitations in transportation, particularly in our more dense communities, it just has fundamentally shifted the way people move around in local communities. Are you finding more people want uh, want to take uh, your cars because uh, now because they don't want to get on public transportation? I think we'll see that shake out in the long term. But what we are seeing is that people are rethinking how they're moving in local communities. So maybe they might take a, a bike share program where in the past they might um, have taken the train. Uh, we're seeing that more in large cities where there are some of these other uh, bikes or scooter sharing systems or programs um, and then people are just wanting 
you know, particularly for essential workers, that protection to get to and from a space um, uh, in in a solitary vehicle as well. And Crocio Science, I wanted to ask you as a as a, a leader in one of the biggest unions in the country, SEIU, with many blue collar workers and the health industry and government and building maintenance. A lot of these are uh, classified as essential workers, but being treated as expendable workers by too many employers. What are the key work policy changes that you feel are needed immediately to protect all workers? Well, let me just start. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, this is, as you say, our union represents uh, uh, a lot of people who are on the front lines of COVID-19. They are the nurses, uh, doctors, home care workers, and employment claim, uh, claim pro uh, processor as some of the building service workers, janitors, uh, and uh, people who are keeping us safe and clean. And uh, our union also represents who we are in America. I just wanted to say that this is, this is, you know, working families have been hit with three simultaneous crises, a global pandemic with underpaid and underprotected essential workers on the front lines, an economic depression with tens of millions of people uh, out of work and losing health care coverage, and a state violence against Black people. And Latinos and Black people have been disproportionately impacted by these three crises. They are overrepresented among essential workers who uh, must stay in their jobs to keep our community safe but they are at greater risk of exposure to the virus. They are also more likely to lose their jobs as businesses reduce the size of their workforces. Uh, and the pandemic is revealing a long-standing divide between the have and have not, those who can work from home and afford to see a doctor and take a sick day, and those who cannot. And companies are treating essential workers like they are expendable. One thing that we have constantly been hearing from our members who are on the front lines of the crisis is that they are tired of the double speak. They are being called heroes uh, publicly, but treated with zero respect by corporations who don't want to provide them with hazard pay, pay sick leave, or personal protect protected equipment. And, you know, essential workers and all workers don't need marketing campaigns telling them that they are heroes. We need higher wages. We need better health care. We need a union in the workplace to give workers a voice on the job. And this is more than ever necessary. And a voice in the policy uh, making process. And I am so uh, grateful for the work that so many of our union members and union workers and non-union workers, uh, they're really coming together. They're joining together to use the power to organize, to protect uh, themselves, their co-workers at work, as well as they, their families and their communities. And they've been helping drive permanent policy solutions that will keep everyone safe and give every, everyone a right to form a union and have a voice on the job, which I, we know right now, this is very crucial fun. And Rosa, there is a federal agency that's supposed to be responsible for occupational safety and health, OSHA. Where has it been throughout this pandemic? Well, what we see is that we have, you know, really, um, right now, we lack of federal response and we see the instance of black and api and latino workers in many sectors such as home care workers airport workers and building service and you know they are what we see in this moment is that this pandemic has laid bare in the deep cracks and divides in our systems and much of what millions of essential workers are experiencing right now is a reflection of a deep-rooted anti-black and brown racism in our society and economy that really don't value professions dominated by workers and people of color and fail to reward the dignity of work and, and economy. So I think there are so many ways that we're trying to just say enough is enough. How can we call workers heroes? and not pay them at least $15 an hour or provide pay CP or the right to form a union. So we know that SEIU, we are in all many different fronts trying to make sure that at the federal level, state level, local level, all workers uh, are protected. And we are making sure that 
any policies that comes from Congress centers workers and immigrants in this response. And we know the campaign that many of our workers have been doing, they've been calling, emailing uh, members of Congress, they've been participating in town hall, virtual town halls, car car caravans in cities, uh, making sure that we practice in social distancing. There has been digital walkout Wednesday to just tell the story of how important it is. And we know by doing all of this, uh, we see that uh, we, we have seen the HEROES Act now with all the work that workers have done is that it has included hazard pay for essential workers, support state and local government workers, so they continue to, to, you know, do their jobs and to service the public. We ensure that previous relief bills that HEROES provisions include immigrants, and we ensure that they have access to economic relief regardless where they, they come from or where they are born. And not only, I just want to say that while we need to pass laws like the HEROES Act, we begin to do uh, uh, this uh, that is necessary, but also we need to make sure that we have a permanent and structural solutions to fix our broken economy that have created and then intensified this crisis. So we need to pass laws like the PRO Act to make, make it easier for working people to form a union and protect the right of workers to organize. We need to pass the race uh, wage Act to make clear that $15 an hour should be a wage floor and not a ceiling. And we need to pass Dream and Promise Act to end criminalization of immigrant and uh, immigrant workers. So there is so much to do and so much work that we're doing. So okay, here we well, are. I'd like to bring in uh, Alberto uh, Garofalo. If you could talk about what the a financial sector, your bank in particular, Bank of America, is doing to deal with the crisis among Latino businesses, which are largely small businesses, and how they are being affected, many of them being driven out of business as a result of the pandemic and the lockdowns in many states. Yeah, well, I thank you, and, and really um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, engage with this uh, uh, broad and diverse group and you know, really important points on really important matters that have been shared so far. So look, um, uh, we believe that achieving responsible uh, growth um, the right way really starts with our teammates uh, and expands to our clients and expands to our communities. Uh, it's, it's that diversity that frankly makes us stronger. It's the value we deliver as a company is only strengthened, right, uh, when we bring these broad perspectives together. Uh, so, you know, to your question, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I want to give you a framework of how health and safety, frankly, um, for our teammates, for our clients and our communities uh, have led um, how we've responded, uh, you know, across, uh, 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 particularly for our employees, uh, for our clients and, and for our communities. And I want to give you some very specific and tangible examples that I think speak to it. Um, and uh, so again, uh, to start off, we're continually monitoring the situation. It's fluid, it's changing. And we've got to look at it globally, we've got to look at it regionally, and we've got to look at it locally. Um, and We've got to bring in and partner with experts. So, you know, uh, centers for uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control, World, Head, World uh, Health Organizations, the community of professionals and doctors, data driven, um, has helped inform, frankly, you know, what we've done and how we've reacted and responded. And it's and it's through this lens of health and safety um, that I'll share with you some of the specific examples. Uh, number one, for our employees, look. Um, we made it very easy for our teammates um, to tell us if they were impacted or their loved ones were impacted and immediately put them in a work from home status. Um, and, and that was really important, right? Because, um, you know, very early on, uh, there was not only were they impacted, but their families and their relative ones that we know we care for. Uh, we provided an ability for them to uh, to immediately let us know and ultimately respond to that. Um, obviously, um, we provide ongoing access to comprehensive benefits and resources, many of which, if not all of which, uh, were really expanded uh, during this time, again, to be there for our, for our employees and our climates. Uh, so we had, uh, for example, no cost, uh, you know, COVID testing, uh, urgent care and emergency room visits, uh, enhanced backup child care and adult care services uh, so that our teammates can secure their own backup care again, with pre-approval, offering up to $100 a day towards backup care. We offered virtual 
uh, doctor services, uh, something called Teladoc that we work with, which gives them 24 by 7 access. You know, the needs are unprecedented to the points that we're talking about here. So providing this capability to them is really important. You know, not to mention we have uh, our own employee assistance program that many of them that, you know, suffered or are challenged in the, to the points that we were talking about. We've got counselors that help them through that, whether it's through financial support, family support, counseling, or mental well-being, which you know was a pretty significant challenge that we've, uh, we've, we've seen. And I think the other important statement that our CEO, Brian, made very early on, it, you know, no company layoffs uh, or job reductions in 2020 as a result of the COVID impacts, which I think is a really important point. So, and there's more to talk about in the context of the employees, but for our clients, which is obviously as important, right out of the gate um and it was probably one of the first interviews that brian was in you know our commitment to helping our clients experiencing the hardship uh from the impacts of the of the of the virus uh through our client assistance program and and that program frankly delivers on our commitment to provide solutions for our clients in events like this uh through a very coordinated very unique experience client by client uh obviously we've remained committed to to the extent possible following this health and safety framework, keeping as many of our financial centers open. Uh, and that's been frankly a balance, but, and the ones that we've kept open, ensuring they have the right PPE equipment, ensuring the right social distance standards are applying at all cases. And, and to the point made earlier, if in fact there's any exposure, having an immediate ability for that center to be redeployed and get those associates to safety and those clients to safety has been top of mind throughout this entire process. You talked about uh, small businesses, uh, Juan, I think it's an important point. You know, we completed over 334,000 payment protection programs year to date. That's 25 billions of funding to small businesses and owners. By the way, average loan size, 78,000, 99% of those loans are to businesses with less than 100 employees. Uh, and that's, again, just one uh, one example to, name, uh, to, to sort of name a few. Our, our dedicated capabilities. Do you have any data on how, how what percentage of those went to Latino-owned businesses? Uh, you know, I don't off the top of my head, but I can tell you that um, you know when you look at the broad LMI representation, uh, the percentages of LMI representation is actually right along the lines of what Dun and Bradstreet ultimately reports, which you know is the standard for LMI distribution. Um, and again, uh, I think we feel really good about sort of the distribution of where this is going to what it matters most, which is really those small businesses that you talked about. And then the last point, Juan, I want to make that I think is really important uh, is what we've done for our communities. Uh, look, we've got a long history of supporting our Hispanic and Latino community. Our recently announced one billion four year initiative, frankly, is, is an extension of that history uh, and will increase our commitment on areas that matter most. So community health services. Uh, special focus on communities of color, obviously, careers and skill development and partnerships, high schools, community colleges, affordable housing, neighborhood revitalization, all of that is part of this effort. We pledged an additional $100 million to local communities to purchase medical supplies, uh, you know, food, increase to learning. Uh, and obviously, we've announced a commitment of $250 million in capital to um, and $10 million in philanthropic grants to community development financial institutions all focused on, on, you know, supporting communities of colors. And look, we are obviously, you know, pretty proud of what we've done, but there's, there's a lot more and there's never been a more pressing time for us to really come together in a meaningful way through this dialogue uh, to continue to really drive these actions forward. Well, thank you. I wanted to get back to Ana Gonzalez for a second, if we were uh, to talk a little bit more again about some of the research that uh, Pew has done. Uh, I'd like to ask you about two uh, areas that rarely get mentioned about in terms of the impact of the pandemic. One is there's been some mentioning of telehealth, which is obviously a huge burgeoning growth, uh, growth industry in the health sector now. But what about the Hispanic elderly who have trouble even accessing this strange virtual world of telehealth where the, the doctor examines you without ever physically touching you? Uh, uh, do you have any sense of how this is having an impact on uh, Latino access to health. And also another area is that you've documented in Pew a huge drop in the remittances of Latino immigrants in the United States to their home countries. Uh, a 40% drop in remittances in April to, to Salvador, uh, to, to El Salvador, 38% to Colombia. So that this is having a huge impact on Latin America, even as a result of less money being sent from those migrants who are here. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, we have not done any research about telehealth, uh, but as you were pointing out earlier, Latinos are more likely to not have access to broadband internet, and they also there's a gap in technology access. So this would be a lot higher among uh, the elderly, which would probably also impact their access to telehealth, as you said. And in terms of remittances, as you pointed out, there was a big drop in the remittances sent to some of these countries, particularly in Central America. Uh, but we actually saw a rebound uh, a few months later. So in, in March, for example, in Mexico, there was a record high of remittances, but most countries saw a drop in the following month in April. But by June and July, so that, that this is the, la the latest uh, numbers that we have, we actually saw a rebound of remittances. And it, people think this is because um, a lot of the immigrants here are sending more money than they used to be. So because they are, uh, people in their home country are relying more in immigrants uh, to keep going during the pandemic. And so immigrants here who are able uh, to send money back home are actually increasing their remittances and they're sending back there. And Rocio, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, the unemployment uh, hit record levels earlier this year, but even in August, uh, Latinx unemployment remains extraordinarily high at 10.5%. Uh, compared to just 4.3% last August in 2019. Uh, and how do we address this issue of so many people being out of work uh, given both the pandemic and the gridlock in Congress, which, right, at least for now, is preventing many of the reforms that you and others in the labor movement would like to see? Uh, this is a, a, a very important question, Juan. And first and foremost, we need the federal government to treat our people like human beings and no statistics. We need policies that prioritize working families, including support for the those displaced during this pandemic. We need an extension of the unemployment insurance and SNAP benefits for these families. All the state and local governments are running out of uh, you know, uh, critical funding and they need support from the federal government. And uh, so we know in our, in our union, our members are organizing to speaking out safe, uh, safely through actions such as virtual law with these actions, government all of that to just make sure that we are uh, really send the message to to the elected leaders to do the right thing at all the different levels. These are critical times, but we also are are saying that we while we are making these demands, we are also preparing to speak up with our votes. And uh, lawmakers who fail to show up for all working families won't win our votes in November. And we'll make sure that uh, we connect uh, these issues with our communities because this is so critical at this moment. Moment. Yeah, I wanted to focus in the few minutes we have left on the future uh, uh, in terms of what the permanent changes that are going to occur. And I wanted to go back to uh, Francisco because you told me more or less what Lyft is doing, but I asked you also a broader question about the impact of the last uh, this crisis on the sharing economy. We've heard a lot about the sharing economy, sharing your house, you know, sharing rides. Uh, sharing cars, sharing everything. Uh, how, uh, given this new issue of public health needs in, 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 in relationship to pandemic, how do you see the sharing economy developing in the future? <clears throat> I think one of the things for sure that we see is that as specifically talking about like unemployment as it's trending down uh, we know that traditional hiring is also going to be slow to recover so one thing in the sharing economy allows individuals to uh, be entrepreneurs and to to seek that self-employment particularly as people look for ways to earn that are outside of traditional um, employment and so a lot of folks are using the self-employment uh, uh, this self-employment model um, through online platforms to uh, to add or supplement or in many cases find new ways to to put uh 
to secure income um, while they're bridging between gaps or whether they're, uh, you know, needing to uh, rent out their house or whether they're needing to deliver, you know, meals or whatever it might be. It just provides access to folks to participate in that piece of the economy. For the broader community as a whole, what we're seeing is that people are fundamentally transforming the way they participate in the economy. They're ordering their groceries online where they never had before. Uh, folks are kind of, uh, as it relates to work, particularly with those that have the privilege to work from home, are going to a more nomad kind of style where they're testing out maybe different communities that they want to live in or participate in. Um, and so I think it creates an opportunity for individuals to participate and actively um, explore the opportunities that exist with sharing their vehicle, whether it's you know supplementing their time, uh, or supplementing their income through time that they might have uh, off the platform or off of traditional kind of employment. And so I think it just creates an opportunity for folks to to engage and the Latino community um, historically has participated in, in large numbers in these industries. And uh, Noel Candelari, I'd like to ask you, you're a, uh, you're a teacher, you're a union leader, and you're a father. What advice do you give to parents trying to figure out whether to send their children to school or how their children are going to be schooled over the next uh, year or even possibly two years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think now more than ever, it, it really speaks to the true partnership that we must have, you know, as parents, um, as educators in our, in our school system, um, you know, and the community. Uh, you know, we, at, at, through the National Education Association, you know, back in May, we launched um, our educatingthroughcrisis.org site um, to, to be able to provide, you know, parents in the community on what they should be looking for. What, what safety plans do schools need to have in place within their community to not only ensure the safety of, of their own children, you know, of, of, our, of our children and our students, but the educators, because we know that, you know, our, our students don't live in isolation. You know, our students are, you know, once they come back into the physical space of the, of the school building, um, we need to have all the safety protocols in place uh, to ensure everyone's safety so that you know, we're not spreading the virus from home to school and, and school back to home because we've seen the disproportionate impact um, on, on our communities of color. So, you know, I invite everyone to go to, you know, educatedthroughcrisis.org um, and, and look at the plans that we have put in place and look at the plans that your districts are developing and make sure that they are meeting that standard. There should be nothing less that our school districts should be meeting to ensure everyone's safety uh, during during this pandemic. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that that's part of why, you know, we, we're going to keep beating on the HEROES Act because the HEROES Act uh, provides critical funding to ensure that all those safety protocols are put in place uh, to ensure everyone's safety so that, you know, so that our students can get, you know, can get back, you know, when it's safe and our educators can get back when it's safe so that our communities are safe. You know, when you have a school with, with whether it's 200 students or like we have some high schools here in Texas with 6,000 students, um, it doesn't take much. Um, to quickly, you know, create a super spreader, you know, event or, 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 or situation uh, within a classroom or even on the school bus, um, you know, to, to make sure that, uh, that we're keeping everyone safe. So, um, you know, like I said, educatingthroughcrisis.org um, is an important site and an important tool that we have developed. Uh, plus, there you can take action and contact your senator uh, through that same site to let them know how important resources are during this pandemic to our neighborhood public schools to ensure, you know, everyone's safety. And, and it takes all of us working together, you know, now more than ever uh, to ensure the safety of our students, the safety of educators and the community as a whole. Okay, we, uh, we're going to devote the last uh, few minutes that we have time to questions from the audience. Uh, I'm looking at some of them now. Uh, uh, one question here, you've talked about your sectors individually. Are there areas where your sectors have collaborated to help essential workers? Any of you want to talk about a collaboration? Uh, raise your hand so I can see you. Anyone want to give? Okay, Alberto. Yeah, Juan, I, look, I think it's an important part. And um, even even to the points I made earlier, despite the fact that you know we've committed the one billion over the next four years, you know, we realize, frankly, that there's more that needs to happen. And uh, the only way to do that is just through really collaboration. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing is sort of we're, we're you know, we, we're made up of 92 markets from across the country. Uh, as an example, in addition to the, uh, the role, I am the state president for the state of New Jersey, which is where I live. Uh, and what we're doing is, you know, through that access and working with nonprofits, local, uh, working with uh, influencers, faith-based, 
um, you know, government officials, other financial institutions were bringing the dialogue forward in a very meaningful way. Like, hey, this is the, this is what we're doing, but we want to combine those efforts and we want to bring in other institutions, not just financially, but frankly, to start to have a dialogue of, hey, we're going to invest in institutions that are going to educate the workforce, as an example. Uh, but let's also try to figure out a way that we can commit to actually hire the very workers that we're trying to educate and partner with. Um, so that's that's one of the ways. And frankly, that's not just happening across the state of New Jersey. That's happening across our firm, led by you know market presidents like me, as an example, bringing in other key influencers to bring this dialogue forward and amplify uh, really our investment uh, and our commitment, not just financially, but through leadership capital, resources, and commitments. Uh, to really make a difference and make an impact. Uh, here's another question from uh, the audience. What underlying systemic weaknesses are being underscored by this pandemic? Rocio, you want to tackle that one? Well, I, I just want to say again, it, definitely this pandemic and the three crises that we are in have their, uh, laid there the, uh, the cracks that have been uh, in place for a, for a long time before the pandemic. And especially in this time has just showed that we need to build an economy and democracy that works for everyone. And this is an opportunity as we're looking where we want to go forward. I, it's, we think, when I think about what is the vision of a, of a economy and society that we want is one that everyone, no matter where we come from, what we look like, or how we speak, we're treated with dignity and with the value of humanity. And especially in a place where when we want to build an, an economy and democracy, it really has to make sure, and you ask the question about what is needed in this moment and what is needed, is being the voice of essential workers. And that's why through having unions, workers are being able to have a seat at the table and being able to move forward on the issues that matter to them, to their communities and their families. And another question, how do Latino workers who fear consequences speak up about their work situation? Uh, Noel, do you wanna tackle that one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really important. I think, you know, like, like Rocio said, you know, we have to let our workers organize and, and, and have that collective power at the work site um, so that they know they're not alone. Uh, you know, we, we ask, you know, our, our parents and, you know, and I ask folks to reach out, um, whether, you know, seek out a local SEIU, seek out your local union to see who is organizing um, in your community so that we can start bringing, you know, our collective voices together, um, not only to ensure that, that you can speak out without without fear, uh, but also know what your rights are, so that you know you, you are not taken advantage of. I think, unfortunately, too many times in our communities of color, um, especially in the Latino community, uh, you know, and, and especially in our undocumented community, you know, the, just the fear um, that 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 can be placed in the work site, uh, you know, shouldn't be happening. And so, you know, th this is why for us as as educators, you know, the work that we've been doing around DACA, um, and not just educating our students, but educating the families to know and understand, um, you know, what their rights are and, and our role as educators, you know, our role as educators that goes beyond the classroom, right? And, and the, the, the role that we have um, with, within our community schools to provide, uh, you know, places for our students um, and, and, and their families uh, to come to us because, you know, we are the most trusted profession. Um, and you know that, that there is and you know we interact with with the families directly you know on any on every given day and so being able to provide that, that trusting environment to come to us as educators so that we can then help them connect which is why we partner with unions all across the country um, you know and including SEIU to be able for us to connect you know our parents of our students you know to someone in, the, in their sector in their union so that we can continue to build of the, the union movement in this country uh, because the unions were the ones that built the middle, middle class. You know, we, we sometimes forget that, um, you know, all the protections that, that, we, that are in place were put there by unions. And so, you know, we need to provide the right environment, uh, you know, for, for unions to be able to organize, um, you know, and, 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 and bring our collective voices together uh, because that's going to benefit, you know, all the workers across this country and it's going to benefit our economy as a whole. Another question from our uh, our audience: How do you see the future of the essential workforce changing after COVID nineteen passes, if at all? 
And I'm going to throw that to Anna, since you at Pew spend all your days crunching the numbers and looking at the trends. Uh, well, yeah, so, so we, we take a look at what's going on right now. We typically don't do a lot of forecasting. Uh, but I would assume that wherever telework is involved, we will see uh, more of a presence of it. Uh, and certainly a lot of sectors uh, that were not relying on it will be uh, looking for ways to rely on it. Um, other than that, it's, it, it's, we, we will have to wait to see how, how things evolve after COVID-19. And I, I think here, one final question here. Uh, how can we increase Latino participation in roles that are uh, able to work from home virtually? How would we be able to, from uh, our vantage points, be able to increase uh, that participation? Uh, anyone want to tackle that one? Alberto? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I said, look, I think, I think, uh, I think sort of fostering programs um, uh, and efforts that uh, uh, increase this diverse pipeline of uh, Spanish speaking talent is really an important component that we've got to do more of. Uh, and, you know, I'll give you one example of what we're doing. And I think that, you know, to specifically to answer your question, uh, you know, we partner with organizations uh, in this example, you need those US. And uh, we partnered with Unidos U.S. to build a essentially a workforce development program in partnership with them, where they are uh, training, um, uh, you know, future uh, diverse, uh, mainly Spanish speaking, in these low to moderate income communities and in these communities where we are predominantly Hispanic speaking or Spanish speaking, uh, and we are committing to hiring. Uh, so to the point I ultimately made earlier, and it's a very diverse, uh, diversified program. It is focused on the financial sector, but it's, it's making an investment uh, into building this pipeline with actions. Uh, and it's partnerships like that and more partnerships like that that I, that I encourage all of us to really sort of be creative about because uh, we're hiring all those individuals. They're now part of our workforce. And when they are, you know, that's the rich diversity that we're talking about. And that's where we can really start to make a difference from the beginning. Can I just okay, well, jump in? Rocio, you wanted to ask yeah, something yeah. quickly? Yeah, I just wanted to just also, because this is so critical that how um, workers, essential workers and their families and community participate. Uh, we have uh, protect all workers uh, that work or protect all immigrants that work, which is a way to just stay engaged, get active, make sure that we are making uh, sure that all workers, essential workers, and uh, they are participating in, in creating an economy and democracy that protects everyone. And especially these are critical times. We have an election coming up and there's some ways when we can be active in the voting uh, booth as well as now virtually in, in movement. So by going there, there's so many ways that people can get active and participate. Okay, thank you. Well, we have barely five minutes left and we have enough time for less than a minute for closing comments from each of you of the main points you wanna leave to our audience. And I'm going to go backwards from the way we started. So I'll, I'll start with, uh, uh, with Francisco. Yeah, so, you know, I think access to transportation, of course, continues to be essential. Not only is it one of the leading factors for economic mobility, but it's one of the key ways we can continue to move forward during this pandemic and throughout this pandemic. Um, and it's just important, like, as we look at transportation, how far we've come uh, particularly in the in the rideshare industry, where historically underserved communities, many times communities of colors, are often already underserved by transportation. So Lyft has helped um, in bridging access to transportation before COVID, and is continuing to do so in cities and evaluating ways uh, to help communities in redefining their community's health and also creating a more resilient community uh, in the future. Um, and so. Uh, our mission at Lyft is to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation, and we're committed to working with policymakers and community partners to ensure that there is more access or equitable access to transportation infrastructure in our country, while making sure we're also protecting earning opportunities uh, for drivers across the country. Um, and so in addition to that, okay, we're, we're, we're going to leave it, we're gonna have to leave it there, oh. Francisco, because oh, you're yeah. already into Alberto's time. Alberto, go ahead. Less than a minute. <laughs> 
Hey, listen, I'll, I'll end with where I started. And I appreciate that. And sorry, Francisco, I appreciate the opportunity. Look, we believe that achieving responsible growth the right way starts with our teammates uh, and expands to our clients and in our communities. And there's never been a more important time in our history uh, to really continue to do that and really drive that forward. It's that diversity that makes us stronger. That value we deliver as a company is strengthened only um, when we bring those broad perspectives together. Uh, and now is the time to continue to do more. And we're very committed, uh, despite the fact that we've had a long-standing history here, uh, to continue our efforts to be there for uh, for our communities of color. Noel. Gracias. And, uh, you know, th this this pandemic, you know, hopefully will be soon in the rearview mirror, but we must not return to things as normal. We have seen the inequities that have been unmasked, um, you know, within our nation's public schools and the impact to our students. And we must use our collective power in the next few weeks to make sure that everybody that we know is completing the census. We must not forget about the census and how, how very little time we have before the end of September to make sure um, that we complete that, but also make a plan to vote. Uh, before the end of November, uh, you know, that is so critically important because as Latinos, we can make a difference in this 2020 election. Um, it's time for new leadership and the Latino voice is going to be super critical um, and we must all make sure. So I invite you all to go to NEA.org um, and, and, and join us. Join us as parents, as, as community members, as business owners um, to help us, you know, bring back the strength of our nation's public schools because when we build strong public schools, our students win and our communities win. So, SEIU members on the front lines of this pandemic will continue to fight for policies to protect all workers and permanently change our institutions to fix the inequities that have made this crisis worse. And our members and leaders and allies, we have been raising our voice loud and clear so that our nation responds to this crisis, sent our workers of all races, our families, and our communities. And we will continue to keep our voice raised to build a path forward to an economy and democracy that works for all of us all the time. We're taking action against large corporations who will take that take millions of dollars in bailouts and we still need to their employees. We're participating in progress. We are continuing to share our first life story so that every leader will know that COVID-19 is far from over no matter what this president says. We're committed to fighting against anti-black racism, winning unions for all, and building a democracy and justice in every place and for everyone so we can so we can thrive. And as we are speaking out and holding every elected official accountable, we are making sure that they hear our voice. And if they don't, we'll see them in November. Okay, Rocio and Anna, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but you got 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, well, I just want to thank you for inviting me, for having you here. And I, I just want to say we will continue to look at all these trends and reporting on them. All right. Well, that does it. I hope we've had a, a fruitful conversation. I want to thank Ana Gonzalez Bajera, uh, Rocio Sainz, Noel Candelaria, Alberto Garofalo, uh, Francisco Avalos for this uh, great conversation. Uh, I'm Juan Gonzalez, and thanks to CHCI for uh, hosting this uh, this conference, and we have a hopefully a better idea of what the future holds for essential workers uh, once this pandemic uh, passes and we get back to some sense of normalcy. Thank you all for joining the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.